So in this chapter, I want to talk about uh, yeah, a correspondence between uh, self-adjoint operators and uh, unitary groups, uh, which is interesting and fundamental both from a mathematical but also from a physical point of view. Uh, so in physical terms, the idea is that the time evolution of our system, uh, so how it evolves in time, is described by a Hamilton operator, which is an operator describing the energy, corresponding to the energy, uh, and this is a self-adjoint operator, and this governs the evolution of the system, but this evolution should be given by a group of mappings which map the state or the system from time zero to the system at time t. Uh, and mathematically, this means that this group is given by exponentiating the self-adjoint operator. Uh, and that this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. This is the content of one of the very important theorems in this context. This is the theorem of Stone. Uh, about which I want to talk. And this, so in physical terms, this corresponds to the time evolution of our system. So maybe let me start with this. So, I mean, up to now I only said uh, if I have a quantum mechanical system, then its state is determined by a unit vector in the Hilbert space. Good. But if the system involves in time, if time is, is passing, then of course the system usually changes and this change should then be uh, a change of this unit vector. And how, how do we describe this? So the time evolution of a quantum mechanical system is given by opera operators which change from time zero to time t. Uh, so this is given by time evolution operators, which I denote by u of t. Maybe a priori t is only given for times bigger than zero. And so this should cos correspond to moving, changing the system at time zero. Maybe at time zero I'm describing it by a unit vector, and maybe I use now Psi instead of X because Psi is maybe the more canonical choice for the vectors uh, uh, in physics. So this should be a unit vector which describes my system at time zero. And then, of course, the system evolves in time, and at time t I have a new vector, huh, which I call let's say Psi t, huh? okay, so maybe this I should call Psi zero. Uh, so this is the system <coughs> at the time zero, uh, at time t, <coughs> and this of course should depend somehow on Psi at time zero, and so I'm saying this is given by applying an operator ut, the time evolution operator, to Psi. Huh? So for each, for each initial state here, I want to know what happens after time. So I have here operators which change the system from time zero to time t. And of course, yeah, I mean, they can make canonical assumptions about this ut, canonical in a mathematical, but maybe also in a physical sense. So what do I assume about these operators? So maybe first I assume that they don't change uh, the length. Huh? So unit vectors should still be unit vectors. Huh? So I'm not uh, losing anything uh, because yeah, I'm describing my system by unit vectors which corresponds to the fact that if I'm doing measurements I really have a probability distribution. Huh? So uh, I should not lose some of my probability under the time evolution. So this means this ut is at least an isometry so it preserves norms and it preserves inner products but if I also assume that my time evolution is ir ir irreversible, uh, which means I have a closed system. I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not connected. Maybe I'm not. I, I don't have an open system which is connected maybe to the outside uh, world. But I usually have a closed system, and so the the evolution is reversible. So I can also move back. Uh, so this is a canonical physical assumption 
for closed system, but also mathematical. It's, 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 it's a, of course, a nicer situation to assume that my isometries are also invertible, because then this means that they are isometries, uh, unitaries. So the UTs are all unitaries. And it also means that I can move backwards. Huh? So I can also go back and see where I came from. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, at time zero, I shouldn't change anything, so u0 should be the identity operator, the one. And then, of course, I have this kind of semi-group property that if I first move for time s and then I'm moving for time t, this is the same as moving directly for the time s plus t. Huh? So this means these operators should have the property that ut times us. Huh? So if I apply this to something, first I, I see what happens after time s, then I get psi s, and then I move again for time t, and this, this should be the same as moving directly for the time t plus s. Uh, so, or, or I don't have memory effects uh, in my description. Uh. So if I'm sitting somewhere, I mean, it doesn't matter where I came from, I just have to know where am I now, and this determines what is going to happen in the future. Uh. So this is a kind of Markov property. Yeah, <coughs> okay, so this is my semi-group property. And now, that's uh, one way, that's somehow maybe the, the global description, how I'm involving in time. <coughs> but then the idea is that such a global description should be determined by uh, local effects. Uh, and in uh, physics, the idea is that I have an one operator, a, ha a Hamiltonian, which gives me this time evolution. And the idea is, of course, that uh, this time evolution this u is the exponentiation of the local effect which is given by the, by the Hamiltonian. Huh? So the question, I mean, this is what we are going to ask on the mathematical side. So namely, whenever I have something like this, such a, a unitary uh, group of operators, uh, so then can we write this ut actually in a form that ut is e to minus i t h, where h, okay, should be some operator, and of course it should be a nice operator, actually it should be a self-adjoint operator. Huh? I mean, formally, if ut is a unitary, then, I mean, I'm putting the i here, so that the h here should be a self-adjoint guy. Huh? So the question is, does such a guy exist, and is every ut with these properties of such a form? So for some operator h, where the <coughs> fact that ut is unitary should correspond to the fact that h is self-adjoint. So, where, so the uts are unitary for all t, this should correspond to the fact that the h, which I have here, is self-adjoint. Uh, and of course, it, it's clear from at least from the classical property of the exponential function that the exponentiation should exactly give me a property like this. Uh, but I mean, we know this for, for functions on R, uh, but the question is, do we also have something for functions of operators? Uh, and I mean, this is, a, this is of, we have, it will be true in the end, uh, but it's not totally obvious and we have to work quite a bit for it. Um, yeah. And so, of course, um, the idea here is, so I mean, actually there are two directions huh, with, with this question. So if I have an H, can I define this U and of T and does it satisfy these properties? That's kind of the easy direction. Maybe the more interesting one is if I'm given, given a family of UTs which has these properties, can I get an H which satisfies this? And of course, formally, the H should be the derivative of my UT at at a time zero, let's say. Uh, so uh, the idea, of course, is that if I have such a relation and I take the derivative of this, uh, then the h should come down, and I should have uh, that d of the t of u t is minus h times u t. Uh, and in particular, if I take this at the time zero, then this is, is one, and then you see that h is the derivative of my u of t. Yeah, and this will be, of course, the idea how I'm going to define 
or find the h. But maybe let us first look on this equation because this is now really uh, one or the basic equation in quantum mechanics. Namely, this is just uh, a way of writing the Schrödinger equation. Uh, so namely, if I have this, this is an equation for the operators, but let me apply it to my vectors psi. Uh, so then I have here, maybe I bring the i on the other side, the minus i on the other side appears as an i. So I have here i, and then I take a dut divided by dt. Uh, so maybe just write down again this equation, but then apply it to a vector psi. Uh, so this should be then true for all psi's. And then of course uh, ut of psi, this is uh, psi t, and here, of course, I'm also taking the derivative of psi t. Huh? So this means I'm having here i d psi t derivative with respect to t, uh, that this should be h times psi of t. Huh? And that's uh, the Schrodinger equation as you usually see it in, in quantum mechanics. Huh? So this is the Schrodinger equation which governs the time evolution of, of, the, of your system, uh, of the vector describing your system. Uh. And this h, of course, is a very special operator. This is the Hamilton operator, uh, which should be a self-adjoint operator. So h, in physical terms, is the Hamilton operator, or the Hamiltonian, of the system. which governs the time evolution. Uh, so a quantum mechanical system, in principle you can say, is determined by one operator, which tells me uh, everything about the system will evolve in time. Uh, okay, so, I, yeah. so in physical terms, this H is the Hamiltonian, and in mathematical terms, this is the generator of my semigroup. Uh, and we are going to ask this question, do we always have a generator for such a time evolution, and so do we have a one-to-one one -one correspondence between this uh, unitary uh, use and uh, a self-adjoint operator? So that's really uh, the question we are going to address here. And the answer in the end will be yes. And it will be yes on the level for bounded generators, but it will also be yes on the level of unbounded operators. And of course we should see what is the, what is the difference between those. Uh, so the problem is whether for a unitary group u of t, t indexed by r, uh, so unitary group I mean exactly uh, operators on a Hilbert space setting f satisfying these properties, and even if I define them a priori only for t bigger than zero, of course if I'm assuming that they are invertible or unitary, then of course I can also define it for negative times, uh, because then a u of minus t is just a ut star. Uh, so it's just the inverse uh, of the time evolution for the time t, that's the time evolution for the time minus t. Yeah, okay, so the question is, whether this corresponds to writing ut as e to the i uh, t, and let me call this generator a in this uh, more mathematical uh, setting, and this a is then called the generator of this uh, group here. So a is the generator of this group uh, ut. Yeah, okay, and so maybe, as I said before, this theorem, or such a correspondence, has two directions. So namely, if I'm given an A, I can define the U, and then I can check whether it has these properties. Uh, that's uh, more or less a straightforward direction. The more interesting, and maybe deeper direction is, if I'm given these operators, this, this uh, unitary group ut, can I get an operator a such that ut is of this form? Uh, and this direction is, is, is what is the, the theorem of Stone, or the, yeah, the main theorem of Stone. And, yeah, in principle, <coughs> what we want, we want to deal with unbounded operators. Huh? So what we expect is that the generator 
in general will be an unbounded operator. Uh, that's also what you expect from physical uh, motivations. Usually your Hamilton operator is not a bounded operator. Uh, and that's, of course, that's the reason that we have to deal with unbounded operators. Uh, we, we saw that very canonical and uh, yeah, important operators like uh, like operators satisfying the, commu the canonical commutation relations or the, the position and the momentum operators are unbounded and the Hamilton operators are built out of such operators and they will typically also uh, be unbounded. So we cannot expect that we have a bounded operator here and this means we should also expect uh, yeah, an, uh, a shadow of the unbounded is on this side. Uh, but before I go to the unbounded general situation, maybe we should do the same, this question in the, in the setting where my operators are bounded, uh, because then we don't have to bother with, with the questions of the domain. Uh, but just to get to, to warm up things, let us start uh, with this easier situ situation. And um, yeah, so maybe there are two directions and maybe let me start with the easy direction. So namely, if I am given a bounded self joint operator, then I can exponentiate it and uh, get exactly the U with all the properties as I'm claiming. So that's the, that's the first theorem um, for bounded operators. So let A be a bounded operator on my Hilbert space, uh, finite or infinite dimensional, Hilbert space is fixed. So this should be a self joint operator. And of course in the in the, in, the, yeah, in the bounded case, uh, there is no distinction between symmetric and self joint. Uh, all, all these properties uh, uh, don't play a role here. So we have a nice bounded operator. And then, yeah, then I should define the exponential of this. So I should define u of t as e to the i t a and we know how we can define this either by using functional calculus but I mean if I have bounded operators or for the e function I can also write down a power series expansion and for bounded operators it's very easy to check that as, as for the usual exponential function this always converges. Uh, so I can define this here if I like as the sum to form a p the form the power series from zero, 0 to infinity of i t to the n a to the n divided by n factorial. Uh, just do, doing the, the power series for the exponential function and of course all those things here make sense if I have a bounded operator a to the n of course is, is no problem and by doing norm estimates one can see that this guy here really converges on the bounded operator so this really defines a bounded operator and I can do this for all times in R. Yeah, and then one can check more or less in the same way as one checks the classical properties of the exponential function that this really has all the properties uh, which, which I want for my unitary group. Huh? So maybe let me just write it down more or less. That's what I have written down here. Let me write it down in this specific case. And I'm not going to give the proof of this because this is just uh, yeah, more or less direct checking. So everybody uh, should be able to do this. Yeah, so what are the properties which I have for this? So first of all, the U of T really are unitary operators uh, because A is self joint. This you can check what is the star of the ut and you will see this is just uh, given by yeah, replacing t by minus t uh, and this uh, yeah or may maybe um, okay may maybe let me write it down so uh, so this <coughs> i'm defining this okay i'm just writing down the properties okay maybe for proving them uh, the right order might be important so ut is unitary for all t in r oh, and i mean this of course maybe i should 
say it depends if you calculate the star uh, of ut then of course you just take the star of here here a is several joint you could don't get anything here you just get uh, i is replaced by minus i uh, which means that t goes over to minus t uh, so ut star is actually u minus t Okay, and then with the second, or with, with the following properties, you can use this to check that the UTs are unitary. But maybe uh, it's, it's better first to check the other properties if you want to prove this. Uh, so namely, first of all, U0 is equal to the identity. That's, of course, clear. Uh, because then only the zero term will be there. Um, yeah, but maybe the, the most important part, of course, is this uh, group property here. Uh, which tells us that ut us is equal to us plus t for all times t and s. Uh, and the proof of this is just the, order, the usual proof uh, to see that the exponential of x plus y is the exponential of x uh, times the exponential of y. Uh, and of course, uh, in general, for operators, the exponential of a plus b uh, uh, is not the exponential of a times the exponential of b because if a and b don't commute then you have problems for doing the ordinary proof huh? but but here we have the u of t's they all commute huh? because they only involve one operator huh? and and the difference between them is just this real argument t and s huh? so so there everything commutes huh? good okay so it's easy to see this and then if you have this and this then you see from this also directly that u of t is unitary yeah, so this, this is the algebraic properties, but then you're asking, okay, uh, so actually where do I see that this A here is bounded? Uh, it doesn't seem to have an effect on those properties, and actually this boundedness, uh, this corresponds to the kind of continuity property which I have for my U of T's if I'm changing T. Uh, okay, because uh, of this, uh, property here, I can move every time to any other time if I'm asking about uh, continuity. So it's, it's only the question, what is the kind of continuity at zero? And having a bounded operator here, this really tells me that these U of T's are very uh, continuous in a very strong sense, namely they are continuous in the operator norm, huh? the norm which goes with the bounded operators. So namely what we have <coughs> here is a norm continuity that u of t goes to u of 0, uh, meaning going to 1, if t goes to 0 in the operator norm. So the limit t going to 0 of u t minus 1, and this limit in the operator norm, uh, this is equal to 0. Yeah. Okay, and so I'm not going to prove those things, uh, so this can be done maybe as an exercise. Uh, yeah, but this is quite straightforward. But so what this tells us uh, is that actually uh, self-adjoint operators, bounded operators, correspond to norm-continuous uh, unitary groups. So thus, if I have a self-adjoint operator on a Hilbert space, uh, then from this, I get a norm continuous unitary uh, group U of t. Huh? Okay, huh? so that, that's the easy direction, but this direction shows us the effect of having a bounded operator here corresponds to this very strong norm continuity. And then, of course, we can now ask the question if we can go back. Uh, and this will be the, the baby version of the theorem of Stone. Uh, so namely, whether uh, if I have a norm-continuous unitary group here, I get a self adjoint bound operator here. Uh, and that, that's the case, and that's, uh, yeah, I will show next. Uh, and there we really have to show something. Uh, but then, of course, the point is, later we want to see uh, how to weaken this norm continuity to something weaker, such that I can allow here arbitrary unbounded self-adjoint operators, and this will be the real theorem of Stone.